Okay, is the city clerk ready? Council members, okay. Thank you for your patience. Good afternoon. Welcome to the three o'clock p.m. session of the August 9th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members, Kellen Tari Johnson. Present. Holder. Absent. Cummings. Here. Brown. Here. Council member Meyer. Present. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Brunner. Present. Thank you. We will begin today's meeting with a, a presentation from Central Coast Community Energy Annual Update. And I'd like to invite Gabe Ruiz, Senior Commercial Accounts Manager of the Central Coast Community Energy. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Much appreciated. Um, thank you for the council's time today. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just start to share my screen here, but um, just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, again, I, I'm from Central Coast Community Energy. I'm a uh, Senior Commercial Accounts Manager I do a lot of work um, in the Artri County here in San, San Cruz, San Benito, and Monterey, uh, but also working with a lot of our ag customers is where a lot of my focus and my time goes up and down the Central Coast. Um, so a pleasure, and I, I appreciate everyone's time today. Excuse me one second here. I have my own technical difficulties. <clears throat> and just to confirm everybody can see my screen correct we can see awesome. thank you all right so thank you again uh so this will be this year's 2022 uh, annual member agency update for the city of santa cruz um, i like to start with just some details on how a cca operates um, I think it's good for new uh, council members and the public uh, attending this event to understand that. Um, so really what we do as an agency is we go out and we procure the energy. So we buy the energy that goes to the grid. Uh, we do so from clean and renewable sources uh, and, and also um, making sure that we are providing uh, this energy at an affordable price. So really making sure the community has access to clean and renewable energy at an affordable price. Uh, you still work with your investor-owned utility, uh, PG&E in this case, so they still maintain the uh, transmission lines, substations, and billing, um, but they, you know, in a meter reading, so they, they, that is still all done by the investor-owned utility, um, but one thing that we do is the revenue that we generate from the generation portion of your bill, we reinvest back into the So right now there are 23 CCAs in the state um, serving over 11 million customers. And I think that's an important piece to understand that we're seeing a lot of growth when it comes to community choice. Um, really the goal of the CCAs is to support their local governments in doing a couple different things, meeting their climate action goals, uh, providing residents and businesses within your um, area with more energy options, and really just to ensure local transparency, accountability, um, and to drive economic development. Uh, you can see that the over more than 200 cities and counties throughout California have chosen to participate in a community choice aggregate. So the agency is made up of 33 members. Uh, we call them member agencies, if you may hear me say uh, throughout the presentation. Member agencies are the cities and counties that have collectively agreed uh, to provide their communities with cleaner energy. Uh, CCCE is the electricity provider to over 400,000 customer accounts along the Central Coast. Uh, geographically, we are the largest CCA in California uh, and represent um, a very diverse community. Um, so within each of these communities here, uh, we participate in different business and industry associations and as well as community-based organizations. So I'm also pleased to say that we have a 34th community that will soon be joining Central Coast Community Energy. 
Uh, the city of Atascadero recently voted to join as a member, and we look forward to their future enrollment. So we are governed by two voting bodies. That is our policy and operation boards. Um, these boards are made up of city managers, mayors, uh, council members, and other elected officials. Uh, voting seats are determined by population. Uh, so just as an example there, if there are any, you know, any member agencies over uh, 50,000 people have their own voting seat. Um, any below 50,000 is uh, grouped together. So you can see there, just as an example, of course, the city of Santa Cruz uh, maintains a voting seat uh, throughout our boards. And then um, as an example, you can see below that, um, you know, the other cities are grouped together. They can be shared. Uh, so, you know, the rotation, how many years one city, uh, you know, staff member may be on the board is completely up to the group there. Um, and we also have our community advisory council. So they, they're really made up of qualified and committed individuals who have important connections to our diverse community. Uh, they serve as the advisory body to our policy and operations board and to CCCE staff on different matters, policy recommendations, uh, customer programs, and community engagement. So Central Coast Community Energy serves over 94% of eligible customers in our service area. Um, some of the accomplishments that we've achieved in the last 12 months, uh, we've increased our 3C Prime, that's our 100% clean and renewable option by 40%. Uh, we've increased enrollment, uh, making us again the largest geographically, the largest CCA in the state by 25%. Um, and our agency is right now, we are staffed with around 30 employees between two offices in Monterey and now San Luis Obispo. Uh, in 2018, or since 2018, uh, CCCE has allocated uh, over $27 million to local energy programs um, and has provided $50 million in customer savings. And uh, we've also established there in our clean energy topic, we've also established their um, increases. So those numbers that you see on, on the clean, clean energy side, um, we've actually increased our renewables. That number has increased by 49% and battery storage by 23%. Um, and also something I always like to point out, which is I think a kind of a, a great achievement from, from our executive staff here. Uh, we were able to receive an A rating from the S&P. We were the first CCA in the state to receive an A credit rating. Uh, and really, this just allows us to do more for the communities that we serve. So really, our goal is clearly stated, right? We, we are trying to provide our areas with, uh, you know, clean and renewable uh, energy, 100% of that energy coming from clean and renewable sources by 2030. Uh, to, in order to reach that goal, uh, we have agreed to approximately over a, a billion dollars in long-term solar plus storage contracts. Uh, we have executed 14 contracts with clean and energy renewable providers. Um, these projects that we are looking at are right now our goal. So the, those four, those projects here with that goal of 60% by 2025, um, right now we are going to be able to reach that goal um, with the contracts that we have in place. And as more contracts come on, uh, between now and 2030, that'll get us to that goal of 100% clean and renewable. So some big changes that we've had, um, historically our rates have followed uh, what we call the IOU minus model. So we, what we did essentially was take, simply we take the investor owned utility rate and we apply a percentage discount. So one of the things you can see there, you know, obviously the years and how that has increased over the Years. Um, but something that I'd like to shine light on is, uh, you know, in light of the pandemic and what was happening in our, in our communities, uh, we felt it was our role to create more value for our customers uh, through a rate reduction. Uh, so our board uh, unanimously voted to cut 50% of all 3C electric generation charges for the months of May and June in 2020. So, you know, with our customers in need, we just, we just figured this was an action that would provide a discount at a critical time. Um, since then, throughout the year, uh, we have been providing a 2% discount um, to our customers below the investor owned utility rate. Um, one thing, so we have had some changes to that. Um, so with
of our new model, we call this our cost of service model. Um, really why it came is people came to us and said, okay, that's great that you're providing this good discount to us, um, but the rates keep going up. And as the rates increase, we following that model have to increase our rates as well. Um, so to the end, uh, we have created a new uh, generation rate uh, that will no longer follow the investor owned utility generation rates. Uh, with the goal of providing predictable, stable rates over a three-year period. Uh, we've simplified what we believe is, is the, the rate process. Um, we feel that this is fair rates across all rate classes and staying competitive um, as well, so that, that we're still competitive over a 12-month period um, in practically all rate classes. So it's very important for people to understand and the community to understand. Um, to, to, to point out where your money is going, right? We talk about accountability. Um, what we do is we would say of your bill, about 90% of that goes to what it costs us to buy the energy for a customer. Um, then what we do is we have 4% that goes to our energy programs. We have another 3% that goes to a rate stabilization fund. Uh, that is the fund that we partly dipped into uh, to provide that 50% discount um, in 2020. And then another 3% goes to administrative costs, contracts that we have and such. So just to highlight some information here from the uh, city itself, um, these are the number of enrolled customers, commercial and residential. 96% um, uh, enrollment in the city of Santa Cruz, which is fantastic. I mean, that is above our average and um, I would say, you know, one of, one, of the, one of the highest enrollments that we have throughout our service area. Um, and just to highlight some of the programs that your residents have taken part of, um, we this year we had 161 applicants for our electrifier ride program. That consisted of um, e-bikes, um, uh, electric vehicle purchase, a rebate that we offered, um, commercial and at-home charging as well. And then we also had a construction electrification grant. So. Uh, this money went towards any project that was uh, an affordable unit, affordable housing project, um, and all electric. So these are the programs that we offered uh, this year. Our fiscal year begins in October, um, but we have ag electrification, school bus electrification. School bus electrification, I believe we have nearly a dozen buses um, that are going to be hitting the ground, I think, by the end of the year. So we're very much looking forward to that. Um, you know, we have a new program now, our residential electrification program, um, that is going to provide uh, rebates and incentives to customers uh, to make switches in their homes. Um, and then also we have a battery storage uh, project that I will speak a little bit more about. But um, what I do like to highlight again is you can see in terms of funding towards our energy programs and how much money we are devoting and reinvesting back into the community, um, that has increased over the last four years. So here's the electrify your ride program. Um, just a couple things that I'll point out here is that again, this is this is good for commercial and at home charging. Um, there is uh, additional rebates available to anybody that is income qualified. Um, so it's you know if if you're income qualified, qualified, you can get up to $4,000. Uh, one thing that I really like that we did on our website was that we were able to, if you went there to look at, you know, to, to apply for this rebate, um, we would actually connect you with other organizations that provided rebates as well. All of our rebates are stackable, right? So if you, if you want to use our rebate and a, a rebate from another organization, you are more than welcome to. So another project that uh, we worked on, we had an, R, we had an RFP that was um, uh, put out earlier this year. Uh, this is for local storage projects. We are working uh, right now, we are working with, I believe, um, eight member agencies. We had 15 in total member agencies submit 90 sites for this project. Um, I think we are down to eight and um, the sites are being assessed at this point. Um, but really what this is going to allow us to do is to store energy at 
cheap times and put it back onto the grid at expensive times allows us to reduce the cost to our customers. Then in terms of our community engagement and outreach that we've done, um, we did 10 farm worker outreach events this year. Uh, we worked with local radio stations, working on educating the a certain community, specific communities. Um, we do a lot with other community-based organizations. Um, there's a lot with chambers and other business associations as well. Um, but I think you know we have a we have a very again I go back to how diverse our community is. Uh, we have a very strong focus on making sure that uh, you know all all you know, all income levels have access and are aware of the programs that we offer. It's very important that uh, you know all of our customers. Um, take part in our programs and take advantage of the money that's there for them. Uh, and then lastly here, I just wanted to share um, another bit, um, you know, in terms of, you know, any, any, any services that the agency is looking for, um, you know, whether it is for marketing, uh, legal services, uh, this is our vendor registry that we develop. So what we'd like to have local businesses, so the money that we spend on these contracts stays local. So we are working with different chambers, getting the information out there because we need these companies, these local businesses to register um, on our website. Once they do, um, when we're looking for services, we can go and communicate with them again, trying to keep the money local. So um, a big focus on what we've been doing here at Central Coast Community Energy. Um, and at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Gabe, for that information and those updates. Very helpful and interesting. Uh, would you be able to uh, share those slides with us? Yes. Yes, Great. I believe. Uh... City clerk has them. Great. Yes. Yes. Uh, I will look to any council members for any further questions. Council member Brown. Thank you, um, thank you, Gabe, uh, for the presentation. It's great to hear about the growth that's happening with 3CE, having been on the policy board when we started up uh, with Monterey Bay Community Power in the early days. It's exciting to see uh, all of the growth and the great work you're doing. I am, I'm really interested in the uh, storage projects and the kind of movement into that uh, that space because I know there are some real challenges with that uh, related to not just resource challenges but uh, regulatory challenges and and else you know other other issues and so I just if you could talk a little bit more about that and um, maybe a little bit about the projects that you're uh, pursuing right now and what the thinking is for expanding upon uh, storage capacity and and support for for local jurisdictions interested in that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say, so we are looking at the, I guess the, what we put out was to get about, we we're looking for one, the, the, the goal, I'm sorry, the goal is to look at each individual project anywhere between one to five megawatt battery storage project. Um, overall, we want to get to a hundred megawatts of local, locally stored batteries. Um, I know I know that in the process right now we are looking at I think we've narrowed it down to eight sites and they are just going through verification making sure that it is the right side this is the best for us if we need to pick different sites for whatever reason um, I don't know exactly where those sites are currently at the moment um, but I know that'll be shared once that has been decided um, you did you mentioned that with some of the challenges and of course there's source challenges out there right now and supply chain issues and there's no doubt that that has had an effect um, not just for us but across the industry um, but I will say that um, you know recently that the, the standalone storage is now a tax credit that is information that I just received earlier today so we're still kind of diving into that a little bit um, to understand what that really means and how we can take advantage of that to really drive more of these projects forward Thank you, that's yeah, wonderful pleasure. news. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Any other questions for Gabe? Okay, 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for that update and annual presentation. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Can the city clerk make a note that council member Golder is pre now present? Thank you. Welcome. Okay, now we move on into the agenda and uh, the presiding officer's announcements. I have a few announcements. Um, uh, the first announcement I have is a community celebration this week. It will be Thursday, this Thursday, August 11th at La Barranca Park. And that is located at 700 Bay Street this is the groundbreaking for Coastal Rail Trail Segment 7, Phase 2. I believe uh, Councilmember Brown and Councilmember Golder will be in attendance with me as well as other local people and uh, festivities and groundbreaking. We have uh, a poster up here on the slide, so you should be able to see that. It is from 12.15 to 12.45 p.m. And there will be free bike valet and parking. All the details are on the city website if you have further questions. So we hope to see you on Thursday. The next announcement I have is from PETA. PETA is the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And the US PETA has uh, named the city of Santa Cruz as one of the top 10 vegan friendly beach towns of 2022. And they um, listed 10 cities. We are in the top five actually and uh, preceded by San Diego, California, West Palm Beach, Florida, Charleston, South Carolina, Santa Cruz and Newport, Rhode Island. Moving on, today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left if you are joining us in person. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside of council chambers. For the consideration of our community, please stay home if you have any symptoms of a cold or flu or feeling unwell in any way. If you are joining us virtually today and wish to comment on an agenda item, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on the screen at the time. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there's also a delay in streaming. So if you happen to continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. Also, when it's your time for public comment, please raise your hand if you're virtual you can dial star nine on your phone or select the raise hand feature in the webinar controls of, on your computer. If you're joining us in person, you can sign in at the front podium at the clipboard. Please note that public comment today is heard only on items that council is taking action on and not on regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are items number 10 through 29 on our agenda. All right, that concludes my announcements. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. And let me check virtually, council member Myers, none. Thank you. Okay, so there are none. I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions to the agenda. There are none.
Thank you. And I'd like to call on the city attorney to report on our closed session this morning. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Mayor Brunner, members of the city council. Uh, this afternoon, the council met in closed session um, in a hybrid format uh, at 12.30 p.m. to consider the following items. Um, first, before uh, convening the closed session, the council voted to refer two items of real property negotiations to closed session. First being city-owned property located on Mount Hermon Road in Scotts Valley, bearing assessor's parcels numbers 022721, 07, 08, and 09, commonly referred to as the Sky Park property. Second item was the real property at 333 Locust Street, bearing Assessor's parcel number is 00503303. On that item, uh, Council Member Myers, ap appearing remotely, uh, announced that she would be recusing herself from consideration of that matter due to a conflict of interest and did not participate in the closed session discussion. Closed session items were as follows. First was a conference with legal counsel involving liability claims, the claims of Denise Susan Barr, and a uh, second claim involving Progressive West Insurance Company. Those items are also listed as uh, number 16 on your consent agenda this afternoon. Uh, item four was a conference with labor negotiators um, involving the following, well, involving all bargaining groups, SEIU temp, SEIU service employees, mid managers OE3, supervisors OE3, fire management, fire, IAFF, police management, POA, and executives. Uh, there was no reportable action on that item. Item five was a conference with legal counsel concerning existing litigation. First item of existing lit litigation is entitled City of South Miami versus DeSantis. Uh, by motion, um, counsel unanimously voted to join in an amicus curiae brief being prepared by the County of Santa Clara that item that's currently a, a pending in the 11th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. Council also received a report from legal counsel on two other items of pending litigation. First being City of Santa Cruz versus the UC, or the Regents of the University of California. That's the city's legal challenge to the university's long-range development plan, EIR, approved late September of last year. Second item is Sunset Farms, LLC versus the City of Santa Cruz currently pending in the Santa Cruz Superior Court. Uh, there was no reportable action on those uh, second, second and third items. Uh, lastly, the council received a report from its uh, negotiator and gave direction on the real property uh, items that I mentioned uh, at the outset were referred to closed session. Property on Mount Herman Road, commonly known as Sky Park, and property at 333 Locust Street. There was no reportable action on those items. Should also mention for the record that um, uh, Council Member Golder was absent from the closed session. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our report on our closed session this morning. We will now move on to item nine on the agenda, the council meeting calendar. I'll call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. Uh, I have no update, but uh, we skipped number eight. But I have no nothing to add to the calendar. Thank you. And item number eight, the city manager will report and provide updates on the city's business and any events of interest. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bruner and Council. I'm happy to provide an update, although I look like a silhouette on the screen right now. Um, <laughs> uh, not that that's a problem. Um, and I think Elizabeth is going to pull up the slide deck. All right, so I'll go ahead and jump into it. Um, November is shaping up to be a really exciting election as we move for the first time to a district election and a independently elected mayor for the first time in Santa Cruz's uh, history. There are some uh, deadlines uh, coming up that I wanted to make clear for the community and those that may be interested in running for 
uh, one of the open council seats, that August 12th is the deadline for doing so. Uh, there is the possibility that that deadline will be extended if the uh, district incumbents uh, decide not to run for one of those seats. Uh, the city clerk won't make that determination until the deadline occurs on the 12th, uh, but anyone that's interested in running, uh, there's great information on our city's uh, clerk's website, and you're welcome to reach out to the city clerk herself, and she'd be happy to chat about uh, the process for, uh, for pulling papers. Uh, this November, uh, voters will elect council members for District 4, District 6, and as I mentioned, um, the first at-large mayor uh, to a four-year term. We also know that on the ballot, we will have a decision around um, an empty home tax, as well as amending the city's general and downtown plans under the initiative, Our Downtown, Our Future. And before the council for consideration this afternoon is a transient occupancy tax as well. So looking forward to, to moving through and um, hearing from the community in terms of their positions on those items. Next slide. As our local economy continues to rebound from the pandemic, our economic development team has been busy at work providing support to the downtown and our small businesses throughout Santa Cruz. A few things that I wanted to highlight that I thought would be of interest to the council and the community include, uh, we just closed a second round of applications for uh, six month retail pop-up opportunities along Pacific Avenue. Uh, this is an opportunity for um, entrepreneurs, uh, small businesses uh, in our area that are interested um, in moving into a brick and mortar space, being able to do so uh, at a lower cost, lower overhead. And uh, our hope will be that these serve as incubator spaces and uh, provide opportunities for more businesses to permanently locate in the downtown. Uh, we have a number of um, exciting new businesses, um, either relocating or moving into uh, the downtown area. Uh, those include uh, Botanic and Lux. That's a business many of us are familiar with. We're excited to see them relocating to uh, a larger, more prominent location in the downtown. Uh, we're also welcoming Motherload, Santa Cruz, uh, The Buzz Sushi, uh, Angel, Aura Boutique, and Big Basin uh, Winery Tasting Room. So it's great to see those empty spaces coming back to life uh, in our downtown area. Uh, coming soon, as Halloween approaches, we'll have a Spirit Halloween pop-up, uh, Yoked Restaurant, uh, Gobi Mongolian, and Farmers Insurance, Pedro Gonzalez Insurance Agency, uh, all businesses moving into our downtown area. And uh, of course, we are excited to have them. Next slide. I wanted to take a moment to also highlight the progress on the Newell Creek Dam project. Uh, this is a massive uh, complex, and I would also add a very cool project that our water department has been uh, shepherding um, over the last uh, several months and years. Uh, so some of the highlights include a two-year project to replace the inlet, outlet valves, and pipeline. Um, the reservoir uh, line is complete and the three new intakes are now fully installed. Excavation of approximately 1,500 feet of 11-foot diameter tunnel around the dam is complete. I had an opportunity to go out there and see this firsthand as the work was occurring. Um, Massive project and uh, exciting to see this really once in a generation um, effort moving forward. What's next includes installation of a new 48 inch pipe uh, installed inside the tunnel, uh, roughly one third or 500 feet. Uh, the tunnel will eventually be backfilled to prevent water from exiting. And again, this is a major infrastructure improvement and investment of our most important water source uh, for, um, for our service area. So just wanna give kudos to our water team for leading this effort. We're excited to see it come to completion. Next slide. Um, unfortunately, as many of us were closely watching the returns from the midterm election, uh, the final vote tally confirmed that measure F failed by a razor thin um, 50 votes. This measure would have generated much needed revenue uh, to support the standard and range of essential services that we, that we pride ourselves on providing and that it, um, our community expects. Uh, with that said, we must pursue other revenue streams and continue to take a critical look at our operations, including ensuring that we are reaching full cost recovery, as well as looking at other operational efficiencies and ways of doing business differently uh, so that we can operate within the resources we have. So 
Big decisions to come. Of course, we'll be engaging the council and the community and our employees as we work through um, these challenging uh, budget season we find ourselves in. And we'll can you, uh, continue to, to move forward with uh, working to get the city on um, a healthier financial footing. Next slide. And then lastly, I wanted to provide uh, some brief updates on our ongoing homelessness response work. Um, at our next meeting, the council will receive uh, a quarterly homelessness response update uh, with significant more, significantly more details on the wide range of uh, work that our homelessness response team and all of our departments, uh, frankly, are working collectively on. But I did wanna provide some brief highlights based on uh, some of that work that's underway. That includes um, the ongoing work around the oversized vehicle ordinance. Um, as the council knows, uh, that moved to a appeal process and hearing in front of the Coastal Commission on July 14th. The commission at that point in time, based on uh, Coastal Commission staff recommendation, found substantial issue with some of the elements of the coastal permit and, um, and ordinance. As a result, that means that a de novo hearing will be set uh, later on this year uh, where the commission will uh, act on that permit. That uh, gives us time, staff time, to work with Coastal Commission staff to try to resolve some of the concerns that were raised by both staff and the commission. And our hope is that when we reach the de novo hearing, um, that uh, permit will get over the finish line and we can move towards full implementation of the ordinance. In the meantime, we continue to prioritize um, establishing the tier one, tier two, and tier three safe parking programs. Uh, that's not waiting on the outcome of this de novo hearing. We know it's important that we have safe sleeping options for uh, all individuals that may need one, and staff is continuing to make progress on that work. Uh, lastly, I wanted to also just uh, note and provide uh, a quick update regarding the closure and restoration work around San Lorenzo Park and the bench lens. Uh, this is a tremendous amount of work occurring across several departments uh, working on the planned closure and restoration of the park. Uh, the first phase will include the fencing and closure of um, the upper park. Uh, that will be followed um, with fencing and closure of uh, the bench lens itself. And uh, the plan is to move through a phased closure and relocation of the campers that are currently residing in the park. That is contingent, of course, on also concurrently standing up additional shelter uh, resources um, as part of that effort. So that work is ongoing. Uh, there's um, significant work happening every day, also in concert with our colleagues at the county. And uh, Larry and Wally, our homelessness response manager, will have more details on that when he brings a quarterly uh, update at your next um, meeting. So that's all I have for now. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for that update. May I ask a question? Yes. Council Member Kalantari Johnson and then Council Member Cummings. Great, thank you. Um, when we get a, a update on August 23rd, will staff or can staff um, speak to the point in time count um, numbers that were just released and, and what the county's response to it is, as I understand they heard, they heard about that today at their board meeting. Yes, in fact, um, thanks, for, thanks for that question, Councilmember uh, Kalantari Johnson. So just last week, the county re released the results of the first point in time count that had been conducted uh, since pre-pandemic. Uh, we do intend on uh, providing an update to the council and the community as part of the quarterly response update. And as you noted, the board received an update um, today. Thank you, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Councilmember Cummings. Yep, similarly, um, I'm wondering if there's any information on what the if the county is going to be standing up any additional services I mean I'm, I know that they just um, shut down the armory and that has resulted in a lot of the people who were there didn't have a place to go now either going to the benchlands or potentially other points in the city and it should be worth no understanding you know how much shelter the county is providing um, currently versus the city so that I think people can be aware of what role the city is playing what role the county is playing and and you know, if it's disproportionately that the city's taking on a lot of this, I think it might be worth a conversation. How do we try to see how other jurisdictions, in particular the county, can step up more to help us with shelter? Yeah, thanks Thanks for the comment, Councilmember Cummings. And uh, we have been meeting with uh, our county colleagues on a regular basis. We have emphasized uh, the fact that standing up 
um, additional emergency shelter is and will continue to be one of our top priorities. Um, we are pursuing housing on several fronts, and that includes uh, home key projects um, to try to access some of the state funding, uh, pursuing additional permanent supportive um, housing opportunities. Those are all important. And uh, we have a desperate need for additional shelter spaces throughout the county. So that those conversations uh, are ongoing. We've stressed that importance with the county, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. That concludes the city manager's report. We move on to our consent agenda. These items are 10 through 25 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you would like to comment on items 10 through 25. Instructions should be coming up on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device and raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature in the webinar controls on your computer. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? I uh, will start on the end. Council member Kalantari Johnson. On comment on 14. Council member Cummings. I'm gonna pull 14, have a comment on, or question for 18. Pull 14, Cummings. And question on 18. Yes. Vice Mayor Watkins. I had a comment on 14 and then a comment on 15. And Council Member Brown. I have a comment on 22. Thank you. 22. Council Member Brown, 22. Okay, I'll start with the comments and the questions. And since 14 was pulled, we'll start with a comment on item number 15. Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah. I just want to thank um, my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Brown and Mayor Bruner, as well as the city attorney's office, and um, for all the due diligence and work that went into the investigation. And just wanted to make a comment in that you know we take seriously the importance of creating a respectful workplace and environment for our workers and interactions and we'll do all we can to further refine and improve our policies and uphold um, what we value, which is a respectful and safe workplace for all. And hopefully that this um, individual who felt comfortable comes, you know, feels more um, at ease now that we've done this investigation and have come to this conclusion. And um, just really wanna thank everybody for putting in the, the due diligence and time to ensure that we are upholding our standards for a safe and respectful workplace. And that concludes my comments. Thank you so much. And item 15 is the Sister Cities Committee Member Code of Conduct issue. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment on item number 22, the Santa Cruz Grand Jury response. And that was Council Member Brown. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say this is a, a response to the grand jury report on uh, City of Santa Cruz water delivery system, uh, our water delivery system. And, um, you know, we have on our consent agenda almost every meeting a uh, number of items that reflect the significant amount of work that goes into our uh, really rebuilding our aging water infrastructure and improving our water delivery <coughs> And they kind of go by with little fanfare and very controversial, but it, it represents a huge amount of work, a huge investment, and really the, the, the very capable uh, water department staff that we have. I know I say this often, but I just wanted to say um, that, that um, and, and as my introduction to just making a comment on this item, uh, I also have a tremendous amount of respect for the, uh, the people who serve on our grand jury, the, the, they take that job very seriously. They do a lot of work, and um, and I appreciate the the comments that uh, were shared, and you know, and I know that that was 
um, that was a lot of work and it was based on real you know thoughtful engagement um, so and, and so the responses uh, being what they are I just wanted to really thank our water director Rosemary Menard for putting together such a clear uh, you know set of responses that I think are really um, explain in in a way that we don't get to talk about in these meetings uh, what uh, our water department does and the, the uh, seriousness with which um, these issues are addressed. So for people who are interested in what's going on with our, <laughs> our water system and um, the work that's happening here, I, I recommend looking at it. I think it's just really like clear and articulate and, and helpful. And with much gratitude to the water department staff. Thank you, Council Member Brown. We have a question on item number 18. Thank you, Mayor. Um, number 18 uh, is with regards to the State Route 19 intersection improvements, um, the contract amendment, and this is less so about the um, contract amendment and more so about um, kind of the improvements that are occurring at Highway 1 and 9. Um, I think about a week ago, there was a woman who was crossing that intersection with a four-year-old child who was hit by a car mm -hmm. and who ended up um, dying because of her inju in injuries, um, and her son or their child survived. Um, and in 2017, I actually had a friend who was struck at that same intersection and who was killed. And so this uh, is something that's very personal to me because um, as many people have reached out with concerns around the expansion of Highway 1 and 9, a lot of it's been around pedestrian safety and how we're going to make sure that pedestrians are going to, how the, in, the intersection improvements will improve pedestrian safety. And given that this is the second fatality we've seen at that intersection within the, roughly the past five years, I'm just wondering if we can get an update on kind of as we're making these improvements and what is being done so that we can reduce um, these kinds of deaths from occurring at this intersection. I would, uh, hi, are you here to give an update? I'm here to respond. Wonderful. I wasn't sure if someone would be available to respond on the spot or, okay, thank you. Um, there there you go. Go. Joshua Speger, Senior Civil Engineer, uh, Public Works. Um, the, the improvements at the intersection, the current project that's happening right now, there's, there's not a whole lot more that we can do to improve pedestrian safety there. Uh, I mean, we are formerly there, well, still right now, the southbound one, if you want to turn right onto southbound River Street, there was a free right there. So pedestrians would have to cross the turn lane and then the main line to cross. That's going away. So that's going away. We're putting all updated uh, ADA uh, ramps and improvements on all the, all the crossings. Um, but there's, unless, unless Caltrans wants to spring for an overcrossing or something, there's really not a whole lot more that can be done. The, the median is being widened, so there will be a more pedestrian refuge if you cross the main line there. But other than that, I mean, new signals, new lights, and that's, that's about all the, the project is doing for pedestrian safety. As a follow-up, I'm wondering if there's any opportunities, I know, for example, when you're getting off some certain highways throughout parts of the United States, they'll have kind of like rumble strips that kind of force you to slow down, slow your speed. And I'm just wondering if there might be the potential for consideration around something like that to be installed in the future. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. That's something that the, the Caltrans would have to uh, address. That All the design out there has to, because it is a state intersection, although it's a city project, it's a state intersection. So any improvements, everything out there has had to go through uh, Caltrans review and geometrics everything else so if it's if it's allowed by Caltrans I don't know if it is I mean we could I suppose we could explore that but as it's designed it's certainly not uh, envisioned that that's going to be included in the intersection at this point thank you well I, I guess I'll just say as a, a comment that if there's an opportunity for us to reach out to Caltrans and explore other ways to make this intersection safer that you know we can get people that, that there's um, you know physical um, mechanisms for getting cars to slow down as they're approaching that, especially at night. Um, I think it would be worth us pursuing. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. I think it's important, um, and I will um, ask Nathan uh, Nguyen with Public Works to also speak to this. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Council uh, members of the public. 
Nathan Wynn, Assistant Director of Public Works, City Engineer. I just wanted to add on top of what uh, Josh Vanegren was explaining is that the, the intersection obviously is maintained or owned by Caltrans right away, but we are working with them on uh, doing an expansion of that intersection with regards to the Tannery Yard Center. So we, are, we do have subsequent meetings with them as far as developing this, uh, further developing that intersection, so we can definitely bring up some of the ideas of essentially rumble strips and uh, to, to enhance that intersection. I was going to also um, add that uh, I think it's everybody's priority for our community's public safety at that intersection. There is an underpass to along the river walk. Um, however, I know that not everyone uses the underpass. And um, so whatever we can do to advocate and ensure that safety, pedestrian safety measures are put into place would be appreciated. Thank you. We have one more member. Oh, this is um, I haven't gone to public comment yet. So um, when I go to public comment, you, you're welcome to comment on that. Thank you. That's it for your question. OK, um, so now at this point we will go for i'm looking for a motion on all um we're going to public comment and then i will look for a motion on all of the items except item 14. so public comment i will look to our attendees virtually to see if there are any hands raised you can raise your hand by dialing star nine and while that is in process, I will now invite our member of the public to step forward for public comment. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hi, Sonia. Um, uh, I, uh, I actually lived very near that corner uh, for uh, uh, about a half a year, and uh, uh, there was an accident out there one night, and, uh, and uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, uh, it was a it was a couple who were visiting, and it was a you know a couple of kids from around here, and, I, and one of them I actually had known since he was very very uh, young young. Um, it, you know he was not the driver, but he was in the um, the vehicle that uh, you know we don't we don't know, but it is, it is a very inherently dangerous <coughs> uh, intersection. It's very busy. It's very uh, it's it's a cluster you know of traffic uh, flow. And uh, I guess I would uh, invite uh, council to look at uh, uh, solutions that are just just along the lines of uh, you know uh, I want to say uh, signage warnings and suggestions about like how people should uh, navigate that intersection. <coughs> um, very tragic uh, what happened last week. That's it's just awful to hear about, right? And. Uh, I, I have a I have a friend who uh, he I met him when he was uh, a grad student at UCSC. He, he, his his thesis was uh, about uh, suggestions. Basically, it was like if you tell someone you're going to enjoy this burrito a lot a lot, you know, and they eat it, they t I mean, typically they will more if you if you tell. I mean, and people make their decisions based on that. So I mean, signage, you know, saying like, please. Uh, slow down and, and navigate this intersection carefully, you know, words like that and, and, and you know, sentiments like that, you know, and, and actually like well-produced signage, it actually makes a difference, I believe. So, thank you. Thank you. I wonder if I could just interpose a comment. I, I think all the questions, <clears throat> excuse me, all the questions about um, safety at the intersection are, are completely appropriate, but I, I want us to be careful about um, too quickly attributing uh, a tragic accident to the condition of the intersection when there are human factors involved and a lot of investigation has to has to occur before a determination has to made as to come is made as to causation so I just want us to be careful about um, making comments about the safety of the intersection which is which is instructed in accordance with very strict standards uh, dictated by Caltrans so um, so again, all appropriate questions and concerns raised, but I don't want us to judge the outcome of this particular incident uh, based exclusively on general notions of, 
of the safety of the intersection. Thank you for that. Yep. It, uh, a state highway that runs right through our city and, um, you know, we can really make sure that whatever we can advocate for in terms of the most safety possible in that intersection is, in general, is, is where we need to be. So thank you. Thank you for all the information and for the comments. At this point then, if that concludes public comment, I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda items 10 through 25 with the exception of item 14, which has been pulled by council member Cummings. I'm happy to go ahead and move the consent agenda with the exception of 14. Okay, we have a motion by Vice Mayor Watkins and a second by council member Brown. And city clerk, may we have a roll call vote? Councilmember, it's Calentari Johnson. Aye. Holder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bernard? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. And now we will move on to item number 14. And 14 is a support for the protection of reproductive rights and various California legislative bills. And Council Member Cummings, you had pulled this and Cal uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, you had a comment. Great, so um, first of all, I wanna thank the council members who authored this for bringing this forward. Um, it's something that I think um, we're all very much interested in. I know our community is very much interested in ensuring that we're protecting the reproductive rights of um, people in our community, especially in light of the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, I pulled this item because I had some additional um, language for consideration to incorporate. And since um, in order to make any kind of amendments to a consent agenda item, it has to be pulled. So I pulled it for that reason. Thank and um, I guess when maybe after we go up for public comment, I can um, incorporate that into a motion or make a second uh, a separate uh, motion for consideration. Great, thank you. I will move over to Cal Council Member Kalantari Johnson for comment. Great. Oh, and yeah, and Vice Mayor Watkins. Okay. Just a just a brief comment. Wanted to um, thank the mayor and vice mayor for um, partnering and putting this on the agenda. As Council Member Cummings just said, this is um, front of mind for all of us across the country, given the decision on Roe versus Wade, and it's important for our city to reconfirm our position on reproductive rights. So, just want to um, thank my colleagues for considering this and interested in hearing your additions, Council Member Cummings. Thank you. Vice Mayor Watkins. I just too wanted to thank my colleagues for the work on this and the staff who helped us um, compile the agenda report and just re really reiterating the importance of um, upholding our reproductive rights. You know, certainly that matters for certain genders over others and the impacts are tremendous. And in California, we can do our part. At the local level, we can do our part. And then also at the national level, we can have our place as well, knowing that we are afforded a lot of benefits that in other states we're not seeing awarded to them and add a concern for primarily the women and um, individuals of genders who are able to bear children. Um, the impacts that we're seeing in other states are just infuriating. And so as, as a woman, I um, feel very, very passionately about this and um, very happy to bring this forward and doing this small bit that we can at the local level knowing that there's more that we can do also at the national level as well. So thank you both. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. I will now um, go out to public comment on this item number 14, support for the, production, for the protection of reproductive rights in various California legislative bills. I will look to our virtual attendees to see if any hands are raised. If you'd like to raise your hand to speak to this item, press star nine on your phone or use the raise hand feature in the webinar controls. And I will look to our members of the public 
to see if anybody would like to speak to item 14 on our agenda. Seeing none, I will bring it back to Council Member Cummings for your additions. Great. So, um, in addition to the support for um, the various state uh, assembly bills and Senate bills, um, one thing to also highlight is that um, this is going to be on our ballot this year for the November elections. And it's um, in the past, there have been times when the city of Santa Cruz has taken a, p a position to endorse um, state ballot measures. And so the language that I was hoping to include as a, f a friendly amendment would be to direct staff to bring back a resolution for consideration by the city council to formally endorse and support California Proposition 1, Right to Reproductive Freedom Amendment, which if passed would support amending the state constitution to prohibit the state from interfering with or denying an individual's reproductive freedom, which is defined to include a right to an abortion and a right to contraceptive by no later than the second meeting in September. And so I'm happy to move all the, um, the recommended um, items and then with this in addition to that. Okay, I'll give council members a moment to read through that um, it added item three to the motion and I'll read it out loud, direct staff to bring back a resolution for consideration by city council to formally endorse and support California proposition one right to reproductive freedom amendment, which if passed would support amending the state constitution to prohibit the state from interfering with or denying an individual's reproductive freedom, which is defined to include a right to an abortion and a right to contraceptive by no later than our second meeting in September. Okay, a motion's been made. And um, I, I'm happy to second, but I do want to also just um, state that that we, in a past um, consent agenda, did write a letter of support in regards to Proposition 1, so I think this is a great next step. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. So we have a motion by Council Member Cummings, seconded by Council Member Kalantari Johnson to add that additional language of formal endorsement. Vice Mayor Watkins. I just have a question if, if that needs to come back or if we could just incorporate our formal endorsement into the recommendation. Yeah, I, <clears throat> because that item is not on the agenda, uh, it was my recommendation to Council Member Cummings that, that it be brought back. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, may we have a roll call vote? Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Holder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Councilmember Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next up on the agenda is consent public hearing. Me. Okay, pulling those notes up. Consent public hearing are items number 26 and 27 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wish to comment on items 26 and 27, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. I would also like to make a, uh, a comment. I understand there has been an update to one of the conditions of approval on item number 27. And you all should have a copy of that update. And I think I will, is Timothy Meyer, senior planner available to speak to that or answer questions? Yeah, Mayor, thank you. 
Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Bruner, members of the City Council. Um, as Mayor Bruner mentioned, my name is Tim Mayer, Senior Planner with the City. Uh, staff's memo prepared earlier today discusses the minor revisions to condition of approval number 17 of the project CP210060. Uh, I'm happy to provide a brief overview of the recommended changes to that condition of approval as needed. Um, if no discussion is deemed appropriate, staff feel that the item may remain on the consent calendar with staff's continued recommendation for council approval of the application, including updated condition of approval number 17. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Is it appropriate, just, just to clarify, um, maybe for the public, that my understanding is that there was some timeframes um, put on that condition of approval and that's the main minor, th those are the, the major change to that condition, is that correct? That's correct, Council Member. Uh, essentially, timeframes were introduced into condition of approval number 17 uh, to prevent um, the application from kind of lingering indefinitely um, at subject to HOA approval of, of the request. Um, so I'd have, be happy to share that condition of, of approval if that's uh, helpful. Share my screen. Thank you for clarifying that. We can go into further discussion if that item is pulled at this point as consent uh, public hearing items 26 and 27. I will ask, are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? Okay, seeing none, I will go out to public comment for items number 26 and 27. If there are any members of the public, you can raise your hand. Any attendees virtually, I will look to those attendees. Seeing none, I will look to in person and we have one person who would like to speak to either item 26 or 27. Welcome. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I've, uh, uh, as recently as uh, this spring, I've, I've been uh, a hotel desk clerk. I've worked at hotels, I want to say, as far as uh, the the uh, county's economy goes, uh, if you pool all of the hotels into one entity, if you said they were all one company, for instance, then uh, it would it would be the maybe the second largest employer in the county. Um, Which item are you speaking to? Uh, twenty nine or twenty the uh, transient occupancy. We're type. not there yet. Oh, okay. You, yeah. I, I thought you said both were. Uh, 26 and 27, okay. I apologize. That's, Maybe That I was my last chance to talk on. Thank you. I just, I wanted to be clear. So items 26 is second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2022-11, second amendment of the 555 Pacific Avenue Apartments Development Agreement. And item 27 <coughs> is the 109 South Rapetta Road application, um, and that is a long title, but those are the two items we're taking public comment on right now. Thank you. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to council members. I'm looking for a motion on our consent public hearing items. I'm happy to move items 26 and 27. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Golder. I'm happy to second that. I'll second that. Oh. Okay, seconded by Council Member Myers. May we have a roll call vote? Council Members Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Golder? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Item number 28 is next on our agenda. Item number 28. This is the 
Transportation and Public Works Commission appointment. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions that should be up on your screen. We will also look to any members of the public who wish to comment on item 28, Transportation and Public Works Commission appointment. We will begin with public comment and then I will call on City Clerk Bonnie Bush to lead the council through nominations and action. Are there any members in the virtual public that would like to comment? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, I will bring it back to in person. I'm not seeing members of the public who would like to speak to this item. So I will now hand it over to City Clerk Bonnie Bush. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if anybody has a nomination that they want to start with, we can start with you. And then if anyone has any new ones, we can go from there. Jeff Mitchum. Councilmember Myers has her hand up. Councilmember Myers. Uh, Ryan Mickle. Are there any other nominations for this appointment? Okay, we have two nominations. So I'll do a roll call. We have Ryan Meckel or Chad Mitchum. One vote. Um, um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Ryan Meckel. Holder? Ryan Meckel. Come Chad Mitchum. Brown? Chad Mitchum. Myers? Ryan Mickle. Vice Mayor Watkins. Ryan Mickle. Mayor Brunner. Ryan Mickle. Ryan Mickle. Okay, congratulations and thank you for serving on our Transportation and Public Works Commission. Next on our agenda is item number 29. This is the resolution requesting the placement of a transient occupancy tax increase on the ballot of the November 8th, 2022 California statewide general election. This is a recommendation from the Ad Hoc Revenue Committee, which consists of myself, Councilmember Brown, and Vice Mayor Watkins. And I'd like to ask the city clerk, when you're ready to pull up, I have a couple slides just to help me talk through. Thank you. So our ad hoc revenue committee meets bi-weekly and uh, we've explored several opportunities and options. This is an authorized tax that we um, see as an opportunity to use Santa Cruz's large tourism industry as a revenue stream to fund essential services here in the city. Next slide. So this measure we hope would align with the county. The county recently passed measure B. Um, it, it includes an increase on the rate for commercial lodging from 11% to 12% and it increases the rate for vacation rental properties from 12, 11% to 14%. Uh, the county measure was approved by nearly 70% of county voters and our city uh, 
uh, TOT tax has been at 11% since 2013. So we would align with County, Capitola, and the City of Watsonville. Next slide. Thank you. The anticipated revenue uh, that this would yield is approximately 1.4 annually. And here it's broken down. The commercial yield would be approximately 998,000 and residential 382,000. Next slide. After exploring all of our options, uh, there are many benefits that we found with this recommended transient occupancy tax. And really, it just creates parity with the county and creates a fair and level playing field across the region. It also helps to ensure that visitors and tourists pay their fair share for city services and focuses on the services that are most important to the community. It also really provides flexible funding, which allows the city to adapt to changing community needs over time. Next slide. So our recommended actions are before you and in the agenda packet. It's to accept the update on the recent work of uh, the committee and two, to adopt a resolution requesting that the consolidated November 8, 2022 California statewide general election include a general purpose tax proposing that the city of Santa Cruz's current transient occupancy tax rate of 11% be increased to 12% for hotels, motels, inns, and other commercial lodging facilities and from 11% to 14% for short-term residential vacation rental properties. And support the measure for the purposes of authoring arguments, providing direction regarding the authors, directing the city attorney to prepare the impartial analysis, and providing direction to the city manager regarding the preparation of the fiscal analysis as appropriate. We did, uh, I also wanted to include um, um, some outreach that we were able to do and wanted to acknowledge a lot of the challenges that some of our hoteliers have had in recent years and um, have really been squeezed with uh, COVID and declining bookings, uh, also with CZU lightning fires and many other challenges and staffing and we really hope to be able to continue to work together and provide um, support and and have this funding source be a support to the city services that we can provide and is there any other further comments from council member brown or vice mayor watkins i'll just briefly say that i just appreciate your um summary of how we landed here and what we're asking our colleagues to consider at this time and just appreciation for the outreach and the work that has gone on not only internally in terms of our subcommittee and all those who are participating at the city level but also in terms of being able to reach out to some of our key stakeholders in our community and um, yes thank you for the nice uh, summary of, of the recommended action thank you yeah I, I would just add uh, my appreciation for the committee, um, my colleagues on the council and the staff that's worked with us to bring this forward today. Um, I will say, just for the uh, little his history, I have been on uh, a series of, of revenue committees uh, here at the city, and this is something that has been uh, considered uh, as recently as 2019. We did, um, you know, due to COVID, uh, kind of have backed off on a lot of the, uh, you know, movement forward on this revenue measure and obviously other uh, matters. Um, but, but I feel, and, and we, um, and it, it's been 10 years since uh, the TOT has been raised. And so um, I think that uh, given the challenges that the uh, hotel industry has faced um, and uh, that history, uh, that this is a very measured proposal moving forward it, and being in line with the county, I'll just say for folks out there, um, if you vote in the city, you already you voted on the county measure, and that applies to county hotels. 
um, and Airbnbs, and uh, that will be the case uh, for city hotels and short-term vacation rentals should this pass. And um, so with that, I'd like to say thanks to everybody for getting us here. Thank you. Uh, let's see, let me go back to the agenda. Okay, so at this time, are there any questions from council members? And let me look at council member Myers. None, okay. Don't wanna miss you. So no questions. I will now go out to the public comment and I will look to in person, uh, okay, welcome. Hey, thanks, yeah, I would wanted to point out that, you know, not everybody that uses the uh, hotels and motels here are out of town tourists, and that many of the people who live outside do get one or two nights a month for the purposes of a shower, because they can't get it any other way. Um, and uh, I did pay uh, $1,800 in the hotel tax at the beginning of COVID. Um, and pay, you know, I, I have to put people in hotels. So, but I'm not, you know, that's just something to consider so that we're just not uh, assuming it's all tourists that have money. Although a lot of those tourists are working people with not much money either. And, um, and but I do, and also I worked with many of the hotel owners in town on, making accommodations for people who live outside who either are convalescing from surgeries or whatever that we need to help out so i do know they are struggling as well so any way to aid them would be fantastic thank you very much for your help bye, -bye. thank you our next member of the public uh when i when i first worked at a hotel in um 2010 uh i believe that the tot was 10 percent and um, that seemed high, that seemed high. And but, but if you look at it just as, you know, from uh, that, from then to the step, step up to 11%, well, that was, that was a million in revenue. And then now it's another million in revenue. So it's a lot, it's a lot of money that can be applied to lots of things. But I, I think uh, Keith's right, uh, you know, not everybody um, that is uh, coming uh, to town is dressed in a Hawaiian shirt and Bermuda shorts and has money, you know, falling, out their ears uh you know it's 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 inflationary it adds to what the person pays the bottom line that they pay for the the um the hotel room and um um uh it's kind of insignificant the uh, the airbnb stuff the the short-term vacation rentals that's um and that's um that three percent amounts to um you know, less than it seems like it amounts to less than a third of what you may, you're making from all the the various individual hotels. And again, I just feel I feel it's infl inflationary and it kind of in its it is, it is in its basis. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your public comment. We have some, a hand raised in our virtual. Uh, I will go out to. I am watching you is the name. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you cannot say there won't be unintended consequences of this tax increase to the tourist travel industry. You just hope there isn't. The measure states the money is to be used for essential city services and not toward any particular benefit to those industries targeted or those who pay. I disagree that affordable housing for working families and the homeless or creating local jobs falls under any normal essential city service definition, but I get it, you have to fluff somehow to get approval for what is essentially undefined purpose permanent money grab. Logic would indicate you are not currently then providing these essential city services. One wonders why not. Perhaps the answer lies in the definition of such or any acknowledgement of a lack of fiscal discipline. I see the we need money to uh, spend plea but no case was made a more efficient, satisfactory government is impossible without it. 
government doesn't have to be or it should be an above economic trend growth industry considering it doesn't actually produce wealth and mostly spends other people's money. Private citizens build wealth and security by living at or really beneath their means. I took a look at California TOT rates and using the state controller's data for 2020, I find 75% of the cities have a TOT tax rate of 11% or mostly less. Ours is currently at the top end of that at 11 and 25% of the cities have a rate of 12% or more. By far the most common tax rate is 10%, although 12 and 8 are the next most common. Only 6% of cities have a rate over the 12% proposed. The very highest TOT rate cities are super attractive wine country tourist cities like Healdsburg, Yountville, Sonoma, or expensive international destination cities like San Francisco and LA. Monterey is only 10%, but Little PG with a world-class aquarium, yeah, it's 12%. As to whether Santa Cruz comparatively has the tourist attractiveness that supports this high rate to me is an unknown. Raising taxes in a recession lacks time and wisdom. Uh, as to the short-term residential vacation rental rate, by comparison, a 14% hotel rate would be the highest of the high rates. Do you have it in for them? Your arguments are weak that they didn't pay one-time lower permit fees long ago. Now it justifies a permanent high tax disadvantage now, or that they disproportionately affect neighborhoods. They are basically normal residences and look uh, like very attractive properties to me. The reality is when the economy grows or booms, the TOT revenue goes up and has gone up a lot over time. It doesn't matter when the last time it, it was raised. A permanent tax increase to me dictates uh, or indicates a government failure to employ fiscal discipline. When I listen to some of you bemoaning cutting any city expenses are the response to pending financial doom, such as personnel saying, oh no, there's real people with real jobs as if that doesn't happen every day, or the practice of hiring city employees at twice the rate of population growth, or passing out an extra national paid holiday to all city employees when they already get 12, means you don't get the message that taking a bigger and bigger, more expensive government bite out of the economy is not a sustainable economic. Thanks. Thank you for your public comment. Are there any other hands raised? We have uh, the name Casey Byer. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bruner uh, and council members. Uh, Casey Byer from the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce. Many of the hotels and motels in Santa Cruz are members of the Santa Cruz County Chamber and have been for years. Uh, we do not uh, oppose uh, the increase specifically but we question the timing. Um, clearly the city is running a structural deficit and once uh, you, the, the failure of the measure, sales tax measure in June, uh, there's a need to get uh, additional revenue streams. We get that. Uh, we understand that the city has to, to, to find revenue to, uh, to provide the city services that the community wants. My two questions are, did you do any real outreach to the hotel industry before making this decision? And if not, I would encourage you before you uh, put this on the ballot that you have that engagement. Many of the hotel uh, owners and property managed people uh, don't live in Santa Cruz. So they don't have an opportunity to vote on a, on a tax that impacts not only their business, but their employees. I think it's critically important that they be part of the conversation. You, you mentioned stakeholders, but you didn't mention specifically what stakeholders you, you did not reach. I talked to several of the owners of uh, some of the hotels uh, yesterday, and they told me that they received an inquiry at 4 p.m. on Thursday before you place this on the on this uh, agenda today. So I would encourage you to actually use them. They're a major uh, employer in the county, in and in the city, uh, and they do pay taxes and create great revenue streams for the city. Also missing out of the conversation is even though it's a, a, an increase uh, to 12% to match uh, the counties, that's actually a 10% increase on the cost of that room. And secondly, when uh, the hotels do uh, group rates, that, that additional cost uh, figures into whether or not they come to Santa Cruz as a group or they go somewhere else. So those are all conversations that I've had in the last couple of days with the hotel folks. And they're, they're deeply concerned that you may uh, impact their, their ability to bring uh, um, visitors uh, in groups that usually come in the off season or the shoulder season, not during the summer season. And, and those corporate folks uh, uh, cater to our hotels, cater to our, our, our restaurants in the downtown. So 
I think you have to think broader about what this uh, this tax will do and potentially the conflict. Thank you for your public comment. Are there any other attendees for public comment on this item? Okay, I will bring it back, seeing none and none in person. Uh, I will bring it back to Council for action and deliberation. I'm looking for a motion on this item. I'll go ahead and move item 29 resolution requesting the placement of a transient occupancy tax increase on the ballot of the November 8th, 2022 California statewide general election. Okay, we have oh, a- I'm sorry, I just read the wrong part. <laughs> I did read the right part. Okay. I'll second that. We have a motion by council member Golder, seconded by vice mayor Watkins. And is there any further Discussion. I have a question. Yes. I'm just Council wondering. Um, one of the members of the public asked about kind of outreach and engagement, and I just wanted to um, see if we can maybe get um, information on on that question and see if somebody can answer that question for them. Yeah, I can speak to um, um, our committee and the work that we've done, this was investigative and we spoke with a couple of hoteliers. Um, I did w along with city staff um, in order to bring this to a vote for the November ballot. I think the real engagement will begin and continue most certainly um, if we vote to place this on the ballot. There is uh, a lot of, uh, discussion and engagement with the hoteliers, with Airbnb um, property uh, owners and various community members. We also um, do and did in our research and discussion realize that even though this is a transient occupancy tax and primarily born to hotel guests and vacation guests, that is not the case always. There are also uh, local folks and, and people who need a room for the night who are unhoused. Uh, so it is used uh, in many ways and we hope to um, have those further engagement and understand um, that to a, to a bigger level. And I don't know if city manager, if, if you were, going to speak to that as well. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I, I see that Councilmember Brown wants to chime in as well as one of the committee members, so I'd welcome her thoughts. Um, so that uh, that outreach will be ongoing. Our economic development team, uh, Bonnie Lipscomb, our, our economic development director, has been having direct conversations with several of our of our key hoteliers uh, just over the past week. And as I understand it, over the weekend, um, and if the council makes a decision to place this on the ballot, those conversations, of course, uh, will uh, will be ongoing. So we're, we're committed to moving forward uh, with this effort um, in a transparent and collaborative way with, um, with our hotelier uh, stakeholders. And, you know, I'll also just uh, admit that this has been a condensed time frame. We're waiting for final certification of uh, the Measure F results, weighing, uh, weighing the implications of that outcome and what would make the most sense for the city moving forward based on a number of variables. Uh, so that didn't lend itself to having the more robust dialogue that we would typically have, but of course we're open to continuing uh, those conversations. Thank you. I see Council Member Myers and then Council Member Brown. Actually, Mayor, my, uh, some of my questions were answered um, by the city manager and by yourself, so I'll put my hand down. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Uh, I'll just add uh, with on the institutional memory angle. So uh, I, I take that very seriously, the, the question and the comments about our engagement with uh, affected businesses. And, you know, I want to appreciate, uh, Mayor Bruner, your efforts to uh, engage in, in some of that, in some of those conversations on the, uh, 
you know, very uh, condensed time frame. But this is also a, a conversation that has been ongoing really since 2019 with the hotel industry. And I, um, as a, with Council Member Matthews at the time, uh, met with um, many, many uh, representatives of, of the hotels and Visit Santa Cruz. And um, you know, we had a series of sessions and packed conference rooms. So, and, and the concerns are the same, in many ways the same. So, you know, some things haven't changed. Um, and the timing is, you know, being what it is, um, I think one of the reasons that we looked at a really measured uh, proposal. So um, those conversations are ongoing, they will be ongoing. Um, and you know, so I don't think it was necessarily a surprise for um, the hoteliers that this was coming. It's, it's really been ongoing. Um, I just wanted to kind of conclude that as evidence of our, how seriously we take this. Thank you, Council Member Brown. And I'd like to call on uh, Director of Economic Development, Bonnie Lipscomb. Thank you, Mayor. And I just wanted to add some comments about the outreach and engagement. And this, this hasn't been a typical timeline. And um, I think the comments by uh, the director of the chamber, Casey Byer, um, are, are critical, well met, and we have been doing some coordination in the last week, particularly to have a set of meetings, both with Visit Santa Cruz, um, as well as with the hoteliers. And so we have a few um, hoteliers um, involved also in Visit Santa Cruz who are in the process of helping us set up an initial meeting, and then we're going to have hopefully a few more meetings and then regular meetings going forward just to keep the lines of communication open about um, what we need the revenue for in general, you know, are many of the same things that are um, interested, uh, a top sort of priorities by the hotels. And those are top priorities for the city. So I think a lot of our interests are very well aligned going forward and communication is the key to that. So we will be working with our hoteliers um, in the months ahead. And similar to how we were through pre-pandemic, um, having um, much more extensive outreach and engagement um, for our line, sort of overall tourism economy here in Santa Cruz. Thank you, uh, Director Lipscomb. And Council Member Cummings, one more question? No, I was just going to follow up on the initial question I asked okay. about this because, um, so I also was on the Revenue Committee in 2020 and remember that we had a number of um, occasions where we met and it was a very large group meeting with a lot of the different hotel owner, uh, hoteliers and hotel owners. And uh, at that time there was polling that took place. And I think even thinking back to then, you know, um, they were comfortable or it seemed like the number was more around 1% um, for the hotels at that time. And so I bring that up because I know that we've also received communications from people in the community who have asked for more and why aren't we increasing it more. And, and I just want to express that um, even going back to then, the direction that the council is taking is very similar to what we were going to be considering at that time. Um, seeing that this passed at the county level and that now we have an opportunity for it to pass at the city level and there was not real strong opposition from the hotel industry, I just want to express that I want to thank my colleagues for their work on this. I think that this is um, a you know, a safer step that we can take at this point in time. And while other folks may want to see us increase the TOT more, I think there's a lot of valid points as well around the impacts that this can have on um, working class and lower class people who may also want to have access to hotels. So I'm supportive of this, um, but also really wanted to see if we could have that question answered. And, um, and that's all, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Okay. It looks like we have a motion on the floor uh, by Council Member Golder, seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins for item number 28. And I'd like to ask the city clerk to please call roll. 29. Uh, 29. Um, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Holder. Aye. Cumming. Aye. Brown. Aye. Myers. Aye. Vice Mayor Watkin. Aye. And Mayor Bruno. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next on our agenda, we have item number 29, resolution request, oh, 
we just finished that. Sorry, I'm bringing up the notes. We are now at oral communications will be at 5.30, so it is 4.41. We will have a break until oral communications at 5.30. Oral communications will be an opportunity for members of the community to speak to items that are not on today's agenda. So we look forward to seeing you all at 5.30. Thank you. All right, good evening. We've returned from our break and we are now at the point of the agenda for oral communications. Is the city clerk ready? I am, thank you. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. For members of the public that are joining us virtually and streaming this meeting, if you'd like to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions will be on your screen. If you are interested in addressing the council, raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or select the raise hand feature in the webinar controls of your computer. You will have two minutes to speak. Members of the public who wish to address the council in person, please line up to the right of the dais. You will each have two minutes to speak. I will call on you when the time is right. 
We request that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required. Please remember, this is a time to hear from the public and we are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will we'll address questions raised after oral communications has completed. And so I will begin by looking out to the virtual attendees. And I see the first hand raised is G. Lee Young. Hi there, go ahead and unmute yourself. Welcome. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Um, my name is, well, I'll go with my G. Lee Young, and uh, I'm part of the Moab group, Men Overcoming Abusive or Anger, Angry Behavior. And we just wanted to reintroduce ourselves to the council and uh, to the mayor to let you know that uh, post COVID, uh, we're back in business again, group meetings. Uh, we've been uh, uh, having meetings uh, on Thursday evenings, weekly Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. at the Resource Center for Nonviolence. Uh, there here in the city of Santa Cruz. We promote and discuss peace, harmony, coexisting, family, jobs, and community. And so we just wanted to let the council know that uh, we're back in business and uh, we're meeting on a weekly basis and uh, we're doing quite well. Thank you so much for your time, you and the council. Thank you very much. I will alternate and now I will invite the next member of the public in person. Please step forward. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm uh, Andy Werner and I would like to, uh, the reason I'm here is I would like to thank you, uh, Ms. Bruner, your mayor, and the city council for the uh, proclamation that uh, led to the uh, 30th of June being Andy Werner Day. Uh, I wasn't able to be here at that time and I wanted to thank you all in person. Uh, and I really touched me very deeply. I thank, thank you. I felt, uh, you know, a lot of appreciation and, uh, and uh, really it was a very, very wonderful feeling to, you know, 50 years. And one of the thoughts I had is right outside, the first job I had with the city on the tar crew, and we tarred that street. <laughs> hasn't been done since, that, 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 and that's a good thing. That's one of the worst jobs you can imagine. But thank you all very much. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public I will do virtually, and it is phone number ending in 4844. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Real solutions to the city's bulldoze the benchlands crisis. Check out the RCNV, the Resource Center for Nonviolence, next Monday at 6 p.m. Hear real benchlands residents. Here, the city manager team, Tuffaker Butler and M. Wale, invited to explain how they will squeeze the 200 to 300 benchlands residents into the already mostly full spaces for 200. How do we provide resources rather than threats? and real space rather than comforting fairy tales. Fences, force, and lawsuits with only token and disabled inaccessible places is the wrong way to go. Many more outside are regularly at risk under the city council's harsh new sleeping camping ban, which Huffaker has said will be enforced. Work on an emergency community response next Monday, 6 p.m. at the RCNV at 612 Ocean Street. Something better than Huffaker's magical disperse them to Pacific Avenue, the neighborhoods, and the Pogonip solution. Support the expansion of the bench lands to end the destructive overcrowding there. Establish smaller encampments that are truly low barrier. Acknowledge that the bench lands residents have kept rough peace and civility for there for more than two years. The Santa Cruz Union of the Homeless, Food Not Bombs, and Huff will be at the Monday RCNV 6 p.m. meeting in search of real solutions and action. 
Will City Manager Huffaker and his lieutenants Butler and Mwale be there? We'll see. Our community and supportive lawyers successfully fought a police and forced them out of town solution winter before last, when the community stood up to police harassment and violence against people who have no place to go other than the token spots that are already mostly filled. The SCPD's hide out or get out plan is neither humane, feasible, cost effective, nor legal. Those of us looking Thank for you for your comment. I will now go rate. to the next person in, in person. Please step forward. Thank you. Welcome. Pleasure to be here, folks. This is my first appearance. Issues that I want to bring up are, I'm a naturalist. There are two natural springs on West Cliff. They're hidden in the cut. Unfortunately, the Planning Commission allowed leaching instead of sumping, and they are horribly polluted there. Also, I would like to mention the fact that the City Council and firefighters, which have been our heroes forever, cannot even give tours anymore to the children that want to know about them, nor can they give out first aid kits. And when they have a first aid kit, in order to change the first aid kit out, they have to take a body to the hospital and then get another first aid kit from the shiner. This is wrong. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I will now go to virtual and I will uh, ask for the name. I am watching you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I can agree composting is a better use of food scraps than is landfill, but the mandated food scrap program shares similarities to the stench of the authoritarian climate change agenda in that it requires unquestionable, unconditional compliance, doesn't offer opt-outs or exceptions for any reason, does not allow alternative ideas, that is, the government always knows best, will trash the budding private food scrap recycling program here, has an, a yet unknown, probably very high cost of which we will all have to pay that you have not disclosed extra collection and trucking of the tons of this mush over Highway 17 to make into animal feed sounds awful for the animals anyway. It is very heavy handed while also impossible to check compliance. Very possibly this flunks one of my basic tests of all government programs does it provide what the public needs, wants, and is willing to pay for. I realize this is not your idea, but the state, in this case, with an excuse like everything eco, saving the planet from us awful humans. No actual cost-benefit analysis is presented for public approval. Where is it? That's a joke. It will be imposed by utility monopoly. It's hard to beat the efficiency, low cost, and soil improvements benefit of self-burying food scraps in backyard vegetable gardens, but there's no opt-out for that. We pay anyway. It's missing a voluntary component. I don't regard food scraps as toxic waste. They are remnants of life. It's uh, not capitalism. Again, it's authoritarian central planning. This is tame compared to the damage climate change ma mandates will do, ignoring the consequences of energy starvation, economic chaos, reduced fertilizer supply, reducing the food supply, resulting, I would think, in mass migration, pandemic, starvation, and war. Uh, we see it already in Sri Lanka and Idiot plans to kill off half the national range herd in Holland. Those who would ban cattle need to understand one third of the land on earth is grassland. Thank you. I will now go that. to our next member of the public in person. Please step forward. Welcome. Hi. Um, many of you probably remember the trolley. Uh, it was, it was, it was uh, may, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, there's, a, I mean, it's, uh, it's always confused, you know, when you say, you know, something uh, is a victim of COVID or the COVID uh, era. I, I don't know. I mean, I think we should talk about, like, really where we are with COVID uh, more more often. I know it, it's, there's, there's fatigue, you know, over that, you know, like, no one wants to talk about it. There's very few people here in person. There's me and a handful of other people. Um, normally, there's, you know, at least twice that many at council meetings. Um, basically, um, 
Yeah, I think, I, I don't know, I think like this, this is one thing, I, the exploration center is open again. I'm, I'm, happy, to, I'm happy to notice that they, uh, that their um, uh, liquid galaxy machine, uh, someone, someone from uh, uh, local government could talk to Google uh, directly perhaps and have that uh, fixed up because it, right now it's out of operation. Um, I don't know. I like the idea, and this is this is just me because you know I'm kind of an uh, like an engineering architecture nerd. Like your new building over here, uh, I'm you know talking to those construction workers, and they're like telling me there's a pool on the the top floor, and I'm kind of skeptical. But um, uh, I think you got. I mean, I I think you should consider the possibility of actually tunneling through the Purissimo sandstone. Um, it's a thousand feet uh, from here to the library is about 250 feet. You're looking at four times that that distance uh, where people could simply walk to the beach straight from Pacific and then uh, you wouldn't have to answer the you know annoying tourists who always ask you where the beach is okay thanks bye thank you for your comment um, let's see our next person is virtual and I will um, ask Serge Cogno to unmute welcome Good afternoon, Mayor Bruner, City Council. Thank, thank you for allowing me to speak this afternoon. My name is Serge Cagno. I'm the Executive Director of Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. I've spoken before about Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz, which presently has 49 independent recovery cafes across the U.S. and Canada. Thank you, Councilmember Brown, who came to visit our program. Thank you, Councilmember Cummings, who had sat down with our group when we were first forming. Um, in the Board of Supervisors discussion on homelessness, there was the talk of the intersection of mental health and substance use issues. I'd like to add uh, also in that discussion that isolation and lack of community make it more challenging for many to engage in services. Many people experiencing homelessness are not willing to receive shelter or support services or consistently consistency in engaging in the support services they're receiving or need support to stay in housing. Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz believes everyone needs a community. I'd like to invite the City Council um, and the Board of Supervisors to accompany me for a tour of Recovery Cafe San Jose to see what partnership with the City of San Jose using CBDG funding cr can create. They have a beautiful environment to pro provide support services to increase service engagement, housing stability, and multiple outcomes of quality of life. I'll be sending an invite for a tour. If you're not available, I hope you're able to send a staff member in your place. I would also propose a pilot study showing the effect of recovery cafe, the Recovery Cafe model in Santa Cruz on placing people in housing and maintaining housing for our community. Thank you for your time. Have a good night. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, public or oral communication comment is uh, in person. Thank Welcome. you. Yeah, I'm Keith McHenry. And, um, First, Food Not Bombs has been sharing food uh, with the hungry and providing water and hand washing and so on for, it'll be 900 days in a row on August 31st. Um, then, um, I'm, we are also providing a lot of the food in the Benchland, so we are there all the time and we're friends with many of the people and uh, we understand a lot of their, the issues. And the, one of the things, people are obviously don't want to really live there and they're concerned, of course, when the rainy season comes, it'll be an awful mess. So um, we held a, a union, a San Francisco um, homeless union meeting yesterday, and about 20 people from the Benchlands came, and they told uh, uh, very moving stories about the difficulties um, they have. One woman actually was up at, she called it Armory, but really it was Overlook, and she, um, uh, is in a walker and she said that the, it was so frightening the staff was so dictatorial and horrible that uh, she found it was better to live in in a bush down by water street so here's a 70 year old lady in a walker who is the recently widowed individual who was so she spoke out repeatedly about the horrors of participating in the shelter system which is very tragic. Another woman lost her, uh, was late to work, be and uh, when she had to give an excuse to her employer, she was put in a bind of having to admit she was homeless, which would jeopardize her job, or 
try to hang on to her job somehow without ad, um, admitting that she, you know, getting a note. And uh, others have pointed out that, uh, you know, that, that they really need um, a lot of support. Uh, so I'm, anyway, I'm inviting you to this meeting to hear the voices of the unhoused from the benchlands themselves and get an Thank idea you. really what is going on so that you Thank you very much for your oral communication comment. You can leave the sheets there at the front. I just want to make sure that's all the comments and then we if there's any questions, I know there were a couple of points brought up. Uh, and is there anybody else in the virtual world that would like to have any comment on oral communications, which is any item not on today's agenda. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. And there's no other oral communications in person. Okay, uh, Council Member Brown. So I actually have uh, an oral communication, which is I'm Lee, and uh, so I just wanted to see if I could make that. I was going to go down there, but um, it's okay to just make a, a communication. First, I will say, just in response to the concern expressed about somebody at the armory who may have difficulties navigating transportation with their work schedule, that's a significant concern of mine. I know others have raised it, and um, so I want to just underscore that, and I'll continue to ask questions about how um, we manage that as the city uh, takes on operations there um, or you know through a contract but I'm um, just working with the Salvation Army because I think it's a it's a really important that we incur you know we do everything we can to make it possible for people to have safe a safe place to be and maintain employment um, for all of the obvious reasons um, but my oral communication is just really quickly, I wanted to announce, uh, we didn't have council member updates today, um, but tomorrow uh, at the Santa Cruz Downtown Farmers Market is an opportunity for low-income seniors, uh, 60 and over, um, if you're under 185% of median income, to uh, get uh, vouchers. And this is a, something that happens twice a year. It's a senior uh, farmers market nutrition program. So look for the seniors council booth if you're planning to go to the farmers market um, tomorrow at one o'clock. This is the downtown market at um, Lincoln and and Cedar. There, uh, you'll see a booth, and um, if you meet the criteria, you can get uh, uh, coupons. I believe it's twenty dollars for uh, fresh fruit and vegetables at the market, and it's one distribu or two distribution days a year. And tomorrow's the day for the downtown market. Um, it also is happening across the county and there are other sites and you can find the information at the Seniors Council website. Thank you for your oral communications. Are you here for oral communications? Hi there, welcome. Looks like we have one more member of the in person. Are you are you here to speak? We're just concluding oral communications. And oral communications is for any item not on today's agenda. You have the opportunity to address city council. Uh, hello. Just wanted to let you guys know there's a bench lands meeting on Monday, August 15th. 2022, starting at 6 p.m. It's uh, part of the Resource Center for Nonviolence, which is located at 612 Ocean Street, Santa Cruz, right across from the Paradox Hotel. Uh, this was this meeting is going to be hosted by the Santa Cruz Homeless Union and Food Not Bombs. See you later. Thank you for your public comment. All right, it looks like that concludes our public, our oral communications. Um, and I would, I wonder if any of the, there were a couple of the concerns brought up if that would be included in our August 23rd update. 
to be addressed. Uh, yes, Mayor Bruner, appreciate the questions that were raised. We will certainly address those as part of the quarterly update, including transportation to and from uh, the shelter we have up, up at the Overlook. Great. Thank you so much, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.